We're going to turn now to Scripture. We're going to be turning to Jeremiah chapter 29. And we're going to be reading starting at verse 4 through verse 14. And you may want to join in with your own Bible, whether that's a physical Bible or whether that is an electronic Bible, a digital Bible, uh, to join us at Jeremiah chapter 29. A uh, very well-known passage, as you'll see when, when we read it, uh, starting at verse 4. It's a letter Jeremiah wrote to the exiles in Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those that I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and daughters and give your daughters, or for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. That would be Babylon. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place, this place being Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The word of the Lord for us this morning. Father God, speak to us through your word and through what you've given me to say. Release your spirit among us. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the first wave of exiles to Babylon from Jerusalem. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had taken artifacts from the temple and some of the uh, upper class and artisans and so forth with him as exiles back to Babylon. And this is who Jeremiah was writing to. And among those exiles were false prophets, he says. They were telling the exiles that this was going to be short. That in two years' time, they said, that the the temple furnishings that had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar would be returned, and so would the exiles. They would all return within two years' time. Jeremiah sends them this letter, and he says to them, no, that's not true. That's not what is going to happen. And it was true what he said. Two years came and went And the prophecies fell to the ground. Didn't happen. And as a matter of fact, a few years later, you had the fall of Jerusalem. Its walls breached and torn down. The temple destroyed and a whole flood of captives brought back to join them in exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It was very contrary to what the other voices had been saying But Jeremiah was telling him, this is what the Lord is saying. 
He's saying, in fact, it's going to be a long time, so settle in for the long haul. Seventy years, more than two generations would pass before they would return to Jerusalem. Jeremiah told them, settle there in your exile. Build homes, plant gardens, eat what you grow there. Um, Marry, have sons, have daughters. Marry your sons and daughters off as well that they may have children too, so you have grandchildren. Increase there, don't decrease. Pray for the prosperity of the city so that you too will prosper. He's really saying, even in exile, because this is going to be a time, a lengthy time, Don't just put your life on hold, which is what they would have done if it was just very short. Then they would have just put it on hold and waited to go back. But no, life goes on. They're in it for the long haul. Jeremiah told them, God put you there. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile. It was not the might and power of Babylon, night not the might and power of King Nebuchadnezzar. God had exiled them there. And it would be God who would release them, and he promises that in verse 10. When 70 years are completed, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place, back to Jerusalem. God had plans and purposes for them, even in this exile, even in the midst of judgment in this case. God had plans and a future, a hope for them, plans to prosper and not to harm. They were his people, despite the exile. And they were far from the temple, which is where God dwelt among his people, He says, I will come for you. I'll bring you back. And he says that when you pray, I will listen to you. And when you seek me, I will be found. And he's sending them this word by his prophet Jeremiah as well so that they know what his plan is for them here and how they should live. He has not abandoned them. And he says, don't listen to those false prophets. They're telling you what you want to hear. Good news is what you want to hear. No, listen to the Lord, because God was in control in this whole out-of-control experience. Listen for him. Trust him. As you settle in there, live with confidence even in this exile, God's with you. Today, we are in a form of exile too. We haven't been taken captive and dragged off somewhere like the Israelites were, like the the Jewish people. But we experience the coronavirus, and we live in a form of exile with isolation and and social distancing and so on. Schools closed, uh, don't know for how long. Businesses closed in many cases. Uh, This church closed. And so we can't gather in this auditorium. We, We can't come together. We come together in other ways, but we can't come together this way. And we can't come here then on, <clears throat> on Thursday nights for midweek dinners or on Wednesday nights for pioneers or other times for various ministries. And there are a lot of things that are hard then in people's lives and struggle with and lonely and so on and fearful and anxious by times. We're exiles at this time in a certain way. Now, our exile won't be 70 years, but it will likely be longer than we think. When I listen to what they're saying uh, here in Ontario and across uh, Canada and around the world even, um, it's going to be slow to reopen and slowly to bring life back again. 
Um, we know, for example, that uh, they're not going to really start reopening businesses at all until mid-May, and then we'll have to go slowly and see how does this work? Is it okay? Uh, do, can we avoid another spike of the coronavirus and so on? Schools uh, remain closed until the end of this month, and who knows if they'll be able to, to open uh, before the end of the school year. We don't, we don't know. And large group gatherings like our worship services and our midweek dinners and things like that, our pioneers, they are very likely going to be among the last things that are allowed again. There will probably be a progression. It may be that we can start small groups before we can do large groups and worship together and so on. We don't know. A month from now? Summer? September? What about another wave? We don't know. But we do know this, God is in control in the midst of our out-of-control experience here. And as we live kind of in exile too, he has things for us and he's saying, I think as well, don't just put life on hold and I have hope and a future for you. It's not the coron coronavirus that threatens us. We're in his hands. And he will release us when he's ready to release us. And when he's let it do what it needs to do, whatever that is, he's in control. And he wants to shape and form us last week personally. Trevor talked about that, about don't waste the wilderness. This is wilderness. Another way of saying it is exile, wilderness. Don't waste it in the sense that God is at work shaping, informing, speaking. There are places that we can look at, things that we can't do, shaking that goes on, and God uses that. And it's not just true personally. It's true for us as a church community, too, as Maranatha. It's going to change us. And we're going to live in the middle of this and we're going to settle here. We're not just going to wait it out and say, oh, well, we'll get back together someday, some way. But we're going to see how it is that we can be church in exile. And also how God is shaping and forming us to be church as we come out of it. And what will it look like and what will the new normal be? And what are the things that he's shaping and forming in us for the future? A number of things that I want to address here. One of them is this. We can't gather at church in the auditorium here, where I am right at this moment. It's empty. We can't gather physically together, and it might raise some of the same kinds of questions as those exiles in Babylon would have had. See, in their case, they had been removed from Jerusalem to a foreign land. They were no longer in the land that God had given them. And Jerusalem was where the temple was, and the temple was where God dwelt among his people. And they are far away from where God dwells. Does he know where they are? Can they worship? Will he hear them? They can't go up to the temple anymore. And that's one of the questions for us too. Can we be church and can God meet us here? Can he meet us online? Because you see, we can't go to church. We can't come together in this sanctuary. And we're going to pause it right there. And because when we talk about going to church, we're talking about coming to a building, we're talking about coming to an auditorium, but in fact, we are the church. This auditorium is not the church. And when we talk, as many people do, about the sanctuary, sanctuary is a holy place. This place is not holy. We do holy things in it when we worship, but the place itself is not holy. It is not the place where you have to come to find God as you did in the Old Testament with the temple. You see, that kind of language and the kind of praying that sometimes happens about, thank you, Lord, that we can come to your house today, that's Old Testament. 
language. It's temple kind of language. It's, but we're not Old Testament people. And it's not a temple we come to. And maybe the Lord wants to break some of that thinking on our part. That about sanctuary and about coming to church, but about being church and gathering together. Because we are his temple when we gather together. God comes and dwells among us, and he, he's there. Okay. So we can't gather together. And at least physically we can't be here. Does that mean God is not present to us? Well, the fact is, we do gather together. We gather in a different way. But when on Sunday morning we watch this together, I can tell you that personally for me, it feels quite something to know that I'm not alone in doing that, that we are doing this together, that as I sing the songs that are being sung, that there are others who are singing them too. We are the church together, even though we are scattered and I'm not the only one who feels that way. I know others who feel that way too. It's quite an amazing feeling actually, considering that you're sitting in your own house, but we're gathered, and God makes himself present. I was talking to someone this past week, and he was saying that, that he had wondered, can God's Holy Spirit move in an online service. Well, we've had online services, and he said, yes, God's Spirit can move. As a matter of fact, we were just talking this past week, so he referenced the weekend before. He said, that was a powerful service. The Holy Spirit was there. He was moving. And he's been moving in our other services, too. He moves in your home and in your heart and in us as a community. He moves in this worship that we do here. He moves as I speak and, 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 and as our interpreter interprets. He, he moves. God's Holy Spirit moves even when we are, so to speak, in exile. Second thing, we're trying to figure out church life when nothing is normal. Everything's changed. All kinds of things. And so we didn't quit just worshiping and close the doors and say, okay, forget it. Come back when it's all over. You know, we went online and we wrestled with the streaming and all that kind of stuff. Technology can be challenging. But we did that did that because that's church now. That's us gathering. And we have bulletin information with family uh, information, uh, you know, our church family, that is. Uh, it's posted on the website. But then we're looking at this and we're thinking, okay, we're settling in for a long haul here. This is going to be a bit longer than we, than we might think. We don't know how long. Who knows? So what about those who can't access our services, don't have, don't have the internet, and so on? So we're not sure what to do with that. But we're examining that and surveying people to find out what's the need and is there a way that we can help to meet it. We're working on some things. One of the ways, by the way, that a few people are accessing the services, even if they don't have internet, is to join a family that is watching online and watching the streaming and to join them by telephone. And so they are put on speakerphone. They can hear what is happening in the service and they can be part of the interactions with that family. And I know some people are quite pleased to be able to do that. There are ways that we can reach out to one another, help one another. There may be somebody that you're looking at and saying, our family has a connection with that person. Maybe we should invite them, see if they would like to do that, if that would work for them. And there may be other things that we can do too. We don't know. We're looking. Because we're in exile and it's not going to be a short exile. Uh, similarly, <clears throat> there are ministries that can't meet. Can't meet on Sunday morning. Kids up, can't we meet during the week? So Linda Wadham and her team, they're reaching out to pioneers on their own private Facebook page. 
They're posting videos of the Bible stories. They're continuing with the stories and things that can be discussed and so on. So they're continuing on, calling around to families and so on as well. Shelley, with junior high, is posting little video devotionals, basically just a couple of minutes of something the Lord's been putting on her heart for that morning every day on her Facebook page. And junior high kids are, uh, are watching that and participating in that. She's working with Instagram as well to reach out and telephone calls and so on. There's no Sunday services, so that means there is no Sunday morning Kids Up program either. So Sarah has been posting weekly videos on her website. And she started, a, this, uh, just a, about a week ago, a new Kids Up Facebook page, the private page for the families that are part of our community. And she's putting on their teaching videos that she's making and, and crafts that you can do and things like that. And this past Wednesday, she had a Zoom luncheon. Zoom, for those of you who don't know, probably everybody does by now, is a way of video conferencing. So six or seven families with kids joined her, and they had lunch together, each in their own place, and uh, with, with, via video. We realized that we needed other ways of communicating than just the website or saying something to you here that you will then hear in our Sunday service. And so we made the unofficial Facebook group official. And it's a private group then of just people who are connected to Maranatha. And it's a way to do community. And community is coming on board there. When we were talking about making that change over, there were 162 members. And over the next week, last time I looked, there were 217 members grew by more than 50 people of our community. That's a significant piece of our community that's part of that then. Some groups are meeting via Zoom. Uh, One group that uh, shares dinners once a week is sharing dinners via Zoom. Each one of them fixes their own dinner and then they eat together uh, on on the video, uh, video conferencing. There are ways to do things. We're looking at that and we're thinking, okay, are there ways to reach out for small groups and things like that? And what's happening here is interesting because there's a social media and a video online stuff that's going on here. And that's part of what we talked about coming out of the Discovery Weekend a long time ago now, that if we're going to reach a younger generation, we need to move more into technology and into media. And now because we're in exile, we have to. And so that's one of the things that exile does, is it takes you out of the box. That's what God is doing. And then you have to think in new ways, the ways that are out of the box. But ways to be and to do church together. And we'll see how that all develops and, and, and what happens from there and, and, and what it looks like as we go forward because this is not just about, well, let's get us through this, but no, God's showing us new things. God's doing new things. Another thing, third thing, we are part of a larger community. We are part of a city. Just like the exiles were. Now, in their case, they were part of a hostile city, city, a city that was powerful, had taken them captive, dragged them there against their will. We live in a different situation, but a city that does not take God as their God, does not worship him. A city around us of people in our neighborhoods who don't know him. A city of people who have needs too, just as we do. And we're looking for ways then to seek the prosperity of the city in which we live and to serve the city in which we live. That's part of being church. And so the food drive was one example of that, a big one, and a big initiative that was taken there and powerful. Are there other ways that we can serve, whether it's individually or as a church community, using some of the facilities uh, that he's given to us and other uh, resources that he's given to us. So we'll be seeking that and continue to seek that 
How can we serve our city? How can we be part of our city? How can we share the gospel in this time too in our city? Because we're part of it. The last thing then is that there are all kinds of voices to listen to. In the exile, there were the voices of the false prophets and of the diviners among them who were telling them stuff like, you're only going to be here for two years, then you're going back. It's going to be great. So hang in there and, and we'll go. And Jeremiah is saying, nope, no, nope, it's not the Lord. It's not what he's saying. You're in here for the long haul. Settle in for the long haul. Live your lives here. Live it confidently, but live it. And so we have somewhat the same kind of thing. We have all kinds of voices out there, and especially on the Internet. The Internet is full of voices, contradictory voices, contradictory advice, people who will say, everything's just a conspiracy. The coronavirus is just the flu, and who cares about that? Not a big deal. It's a, and, 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 and all kinds of things that are on the Internet. All kinds of voices. Who do you listen to? It can be confusing. It can sow distrust. It can sow into your lives and into our hearts fear, anxiety, and distrust of one another and of authority. And so Jeremiah would say, don't let that happen to you. Don't listen to those voices. Listen for the Lord. But don't listen to all those voices. And don't let distrust be sown into your heart. Don't let fear and anxiety be sown into your heart. Turn to God. Look for Him. Spend time in His Word. If You, you probably have more time for that. And so on. Don't listen. Don't let confusion, distrust, fear, anxiety be sown. Now, what we're doing here in this time of exile is we are trying to figure out how to be church, what that looks like here, now, in this place, this environment in which we find ourselves, but also how it's going to change us, because it's going to change us. There'll be a new normal. It won't be the same. And it'll change church. And we need to not just let it change us, but be seeking the Lord as to how do you want to change us? What do you see? What kind of church do you want to see emerge from this as we be church here now? And so we're seeking to gather. And we're seeking to connect. And we're seeking to be part of our community and serve it. And we're seeking to discern what life will look like in the future, knowing this. God is in control. He has things to say to us. He has places to take us. We're not just marking time in between, but living confidently here, being church here, now, and into the future, whatever that looks like. Now, we've just come into the month of May, first Sunday of May. The last Sunday of May, May 31st, four weeks from now, is Pentecost. Pentecost is the day in the history of the church when God poured out the Holy Spirit, as you read about it in the book of Acts. And it's the birth of the church. And the birth of a church that would serve Jesus and spread throughout the whole world, that would listen to him, be guided by him, Jesus had said to the disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you have received power from on high, until you have received the promised Holy Spirit. We're in a form of waiting. But we can use that waiting, too, for the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit personally in our own lives. We need the Holy Spirit in our church life as well. It's His power, it's His life that fills us and causes, enables us to do the things that He wants done. It's His guidance, it's His direction that shows us the way as we seek to walk in it. So I want to make a suggestion. It's one I ran across online. And I thought it was an interesting one. 
you might consider doing a devotional based on the book of Acts and read one chapter per day. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts in 28 days until Pentecost. So read it and see what the early church looked like and how God moved there. Read about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and it really is a book about the Holy Spirit in many different ways. And then be praying as we come to that Pentecost service as well. But be praying that in this time there will be a Pentecost for you in your own life that God will fill you with the Holy Spirit and with the power of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, the life of the Holy Spirit. And be praying that for Maranatha as well, for us as a church, to be filled with the Spirit, that we may make a difference in this world as we seek to be church. I want to close with this. The core of everything is trust. Trusting God. That's really what Jeremiah was saying to the exiles in Babylon was trust me, trust God. Trust what he is saying. Trust what he is doing. Trust his love and his care even in a time of judgment that they were in. Trust that he will release you When it's time, in fact, he's already made plans for that. For us, trust. That he knows exactly what's going on. That even though everything feels out of control, it is not. He is in control. He knows when he will release us and when it is time. He's already planned it. Trust. Trust because God is faithful. He is always faithful. Great is his faithfulness. Father God, as we close this portion off, we want to focus on your faithfulness. You're a great God, and your mercies are new every morning, and may we experience that as we are exiles here in this time of the COVID virus. Make yourself new to us every morning. And pour out your life, your love, your thoughts, your confidence. And may we trust you in this place too, because you are faithful. We pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.